Hello everyone, my name is uh, Gustavo Zaposnik. I'm the editor in chief for the World Stroke Academy, uh, uh, the educational platform for the Stroke uh, World Stroke Organization. And today we have the privilege to have Dr. Jonathan Coutinho. He is the principal or co-principal investigator of the international uh, um, cerebrovascular thrombosis uh, 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 project and registry. And he has been one of the most prolific investigators for cerebral venous thrombosis. He's an, uh, uh, at the, uh, a, a faculty member at the Amsterdam Medical Center. Uh, uh, and uh, we have the opportunity to uh, have him and to hear his vision about the progress of the, uh, in this field uh, in the next few years and to comment what were the, the results about the CBT submit that just happened in Amsterdam a couple of weeks ago. Jonathan, welcome and thank you for joining. Thank you, Gustavo. Thank you so much for having me. It's a great pleasure. Excellent. So Jonathan, if you have to summarize what happened in the uh, uh, CBT submit, or you know, if you can mention what was the purpose of doing the CBT submit? Sure. Uh, sure. So the idea to have a, a summit dedicated to cerebral venous thrombosis originated about a year ago. And, um, and the reason was, so, you know, of course, I mean, CVT is a rare disease, right? So pretty much all of the decent research that's being done in the world is, doing, is being done in international collaboration, which is great, but it also means that you don't see each other that often. So we, we tend to see each other during conferences, usually European and uh, sometimes also the world and the international stroke conferences. Um, and we always discuss ongoing studies, but what we, we never had time to is to sit down with like a, a group of experts from every direction and to ded have like dedicated time to discuss, okay, so where does the research should be, where should we be going and what direction should we be going? So not looking at the present, but looking at the future 10, 20 years ahead what are the burning clinical questions that we want to solve? That, that was the reason why we thought we need to have like a summit, one, two days dedicated to answering these questions or, or basically formulating these questions. That was the real purpose. Thank you. So what do you think that there were the principal outcomes of that meeting? What do you think that, you know, uh, uh, we learn in, 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 in these two days? Uh, oh. I mean, I think it was very, it was very interesting and very fulfilling. So, so we had between 40 and 50 participants, which is what we were aiming for. We didn't want to have too big a group, right? We wanted to have like a lively discussion. And I think if the big, if the group becomes too big, it becomes difficult. So we had a way where we said, we, we defined beforehand a couple of themes and we said, these are the six major themes. And what we did is uh, every theme was discussed in a plenary session. So there was like a panel that did like a kickoff of that particular theme. Then the whole group could discuss it. And then we had these breakout sessions where smaller groups discussed about these themes in more in depth with us, with a smaller group, more discussion. Um, they came up with like a list of concrete questions and they reported those back to the whole group. And then we could discuss again. And, and that's the way we formulated these questions. Um, so, and, and what we had, we had, um, it was a combination of um, mostly neurologists who've been working on CVT for a longer time, but we also had experts like thrombosis experts from other areas, epidemiologists. So people, for instance, from the general thrombosis uh, research who, where we can learn a lot, but we also had patients there and we had some members of pharmaceutical companies. So it was really, it was really a mix of people. And um, so, so the six themes that we discussed were uh, epidemiology, that was one, with clinical features. Uh, we discussed life after CVT, which is focused on like the, 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 the symptoms and the complaints that these patients have after they, they go through their CVT. We discussed uh, neuroimaging and diagnosis. We discussed pathophysiology. And then we, and then we had two themes aimed at treatment, one on medication and one on endovascular. So, so that was how we organized um, uh, the summit. Thank you, Jonathan, that's, uh, that's great. So what do you think that is going to happen in the next five or you know, 10 years uh, in the field of cerebral venous thrombosis? Let me mm -hmm. give you an, an example. You know, 
and you were part of the European guidelines the, uh, and other guidelines. Uh, so the, the question is, do you think that there is a uh, expansion of the opportunity for uh, endovascular thrombectomy in the same way that may have happened you know, in the field of uh, uh, acute ischemic stroke for cerebrovenous thrombosis? I think so. Yes, I think so. I mean, as you know, I, I was one of the principal investigators of the randomized trial, the two-act trial that evaluated endovascular treatment. It was neutral, um, uh, the, the trial for, for endovascular treatment of CBT. But we've been thinking about new trials ever since. I also think that before we embark upon a new trial, there's a couple of things that we need to figure out. Um, and I think we've learned that in partly from two-act, so the previous trial, but also from the ischemic stroke thrombectomy trial. So I, I think definitely a new trial should be done, but it, we shouldn't rush towards that new trial because I think if we rush towards a new trial, there's a risk that we're gonna make uh, some of the mistakes in hindsight, we know that some things were not perfect in the two-act trial, uh, similar to what happened in ischemic stroke. So we need to get some things straightened out and then we should do a new trial. So for instance, the things that, and that was also heavily discussed, the things that we need to figure out are, first of all, do we have the right device to open up these vessels? So two-act trial was very pragmatic, right? Basically we said, use any device that the interventionist thought that was the right way. Um, but I think what we see is that um, some of these devices are really not suitable to recanalize the venous system. And if we know that we cannot recanalize the the venous system, doing a trial with that device is obviously pointless. And I'm not an interventionist myself, so there's various opinions on this. Some people think that we have the devices. Other people think that specific devices for the cerebral venous system need to be developed. And, and we've been talking to industry about this, and, and there's some interest. It's a rare disease, right? So it's not easy to get interest from, from device companies, but there certainly is some interest. So, so that, for instance, is a very important topic. What's also very important is how do we grade technical success, right? We should be looking at, we do this procedure and then afterwards you should be looking, okay, did we succeed in opening, achieving our goal, right? Same to the TIKI score in, in ischemic strokes, very important. So in case the trial is neutral again, that we know is that because we weren't able to open up the vessel or we did open up the vessel and it just didn't help the patient because that's also a possibility. Uh, and then there's a very big point on patient selection. I think. Right now, um, we don't exactly know who may benefit from endovascular treatment, right? And that is, that is kind of tricky. And it's, I think it's a lot easier in ischemic stroke where if you find a patient with an LVO, we now know from pretty much every trial that it almost doesn't matter anymore. If they have an LVO, you should treat it and it works. Uh, for CVT, we don't have such an easy imaging um, um, uh, feature that tells us, well, this is the right patient to randomize. And uh, that's something that we need to look into. We need to do studies. Uh, it my, my belief is that it's probably going to be a combination of clinical symptoms, but also some kind of imaging symptoms, probably um, some sort of perfusion imaging. We haven't done a lot of perfusion imaging in, in CVT, but I, I do think that there's merit in doing that and looking at the idea of tissue at risk, right? That's basically what we want to do. If we can, if we can figure out the patient that's most likely to benefit from endovascular treatment, uh, and then those are the patients that we should be randomizing or enrolling into a trial. Thank you, Jonathan. Two more questions, and one is related with, you know, um, uh, uh, the the tension, there is a tension between initiating anticoagulation therapy, for example, in patients with cerebral venous thrombosis who have a hemorrhagic conversion so especially for non-experts so that the question is how you know what are the risk factors associated with poor prognosis in patients with cerebral venous thrombosis so the question is not probably for a stroke neurology but you know emergency department physicians and you know general neurologists I mean, I think the data that we have, it's always a concern, right? I mean, 40% of these patients have a, a hemorrhage before we even do anything, right? So, so starting anticoagulation is always, uh, there's always some concern. I think all the data show that almost in every patient, it's better to start anticoagulation. It just, it, 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 I don't have any doubt. I mean, there's, there's always a very small percentage where 
you do not give anticoagulation for various rare reasons, but in general, if you diagnose CVD, you should give anticoagulation. That doesn't mean that there's a lot of interest in looking into future drugs that may have a better safety profile. And uh, a lot of that is, is coming over from uh, the uh, ischemic stroke part where, for instance, there's now a lot of interest in, for instance, the factor 11 inhibitors, right? They're being tested in ischemic stroke uh, and also in AF. And I mean, we need to see whether the hypothesis behind these drugs is true, but the hypothesis is that you reduce the risk of, of thrombosis or embolus formation without increasing the risk of bleeding. Well, I mean, that combination sounds uh, great for every condition, but especially for CVT. So I think if we once that has been established in the more common condition, factor 11 inhibitors definitely would be an interesting group to look at for the treatment of CVT. Um, and there's also some very new uh, thrombolytic drugs that are be, be, being examined, right? I mean, I think what we're learning, especially if, like from the work of Diana Aguarda Sousa, she's showing that like early recanalization in CVT it occurs, it occurs really early, probably already in a week. And there's also a good suggestion that early recolonization improves outcome, which makes sense, but it's still important to show. And once that's clearly established, finding drugs, any kind of drug, anticoagulation or thrombolytic drug that speeds up this process of recolonization is definitely worth looking at. But when doing that, we always have to balance the risk of bleeding, right? That's that's just a, a thing we always have to consider in any uh, trial of CVT patients. Thank you, Jonathan. That's great. Last question is, imagine that there are, you know, uh, residents, neurology residents, internal medicine residents, or junior faculty and emergency department dogs. One of the concerns and, you know, involving, including in medical legal, uh, you know, uh, cases is how to avoid, you know, missing patient with cerebral venous thrombosis. So what would be your tips. Yeah. So um, it's always a difficult one, right? Because it, 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 rain, it remains a rare, de a rare disease uh, with a very various um, uh, uh, mode of presentation. So um, I think especially in uh, first look at the demographics, right? If, if it's a young patient uh, with uh, a female patient who recently started um, uh, oral contraceptives, or if it's a patient who recently developed, uh, um, um, uh, delivered a baby, I mean, those are obvious risk factors, right? So know your demographics, that's, that's definitely one. Um, and then um, headache, I mean, headache is almost always the first symptom uh, and almost always it's a very severe headache. Now asking whether it's left or right or on both sides, that in my experience doesn't really help. What is evident is that almost all of these patients will say that the headache that they're having is the worst headache they ever had, right? So, so that's really something that will help. And, and sometimes it mimics seborrheic hemorrhage, right? Sometimes they'll say it's an acute onset thunderclap headache. That can also be part of CBT, but usually they'll have a worst headache ever. Um, and, and then I think, I mean, once you do imaging, even if you do a non-contrast CT, and that's actually something that we're looking at, because um, we do non-contrast CTs quite often in these patients. I think uh, with the proper training, in most of the patients, you'll see hints of CVT on a non-contrast CT, even if there's no parenchymal lesions. So knowing what to look for, and then in that setting, confirming it obviously with some kind of phonography, but mm -hmm. that can really help. Now, looking at the future, what I hope, because I mean, it's still gonna be complicated. If you're an ER physician, maybe you'll see one or two of these patients probably in a lifetime, right? So it won't be easy to recognize. So. For the future, I hope that we'll be able to develop like a, a clinical score similar to like the Wells criteria. We did develop that a few years back, but needs to be validated. And that we can combine that with some kind of easy biomarker like the D-dimers to at least rule out CVT. I think that would really help that we have like a very easy test, a clinical score with a biomarker that you have in like an hour and that's low cost. And at the very least that can rule out CVT in the majority of these cases, uh, cases, I think looking at the future, if we if we um, resolve that issue in the next ten or twenty years, I think that would be a really important landmark. Thank you very much, Jonathan. So again, the take-home message will be: first of all, think about CBT, identifying a pattern, young childbearing women, you know, who are starting on oral contraceptives or have any other risk factors among a long list 
from dehydration perhaps to yeah. an underlying infection, et cetera. And those are puerperium uh, 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 period that will give you the hint in somebody coming to the emergency department with headaches that is usually present in over 90% of patients. So uh, plus the combination with uh, biomarkers and maybe medical uh, advances with medical imaging. So that's, uh, that's a great advice. So thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. It was a uh, great pleasure for us to having you and uh, uh, talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.